A good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event. I am Michael Waldman. I am the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. And we're so thrilled to have you join us for this really interesting and really important conversation about an exciting new book. Um, before we get started, I do want to share a few housekeeping notes. We, if we were in a theater, I'd tell you to turn off your cell phones. Um, the first thing I do want to uh, mention is that we will have time uh, for questions uh, for, for, our, uh, for our guests uh, at the end of this discussion. And if you have a question that you would like to ask, please uh, add the question to uh, our YouTube and Facebook chat. The second thing I would say is that civility is very important to all of us at the Brennan Center. And anybody who posts rude or intemperate uh, language in our message streams on YouTube here or Facebook will be removed from the conversation. And finally, uh, we do provide closed captioning. Um, and uh, for those of you joining us for the first time for one of these wonderful uh, Zoom uh, video events. Um, the Brennan Center for Justice is a nonpartisan law and policy institute. We work to reform, to strengthen, when necessary, to defend the systems of democracy and justice in our country so they work for all. Uh, it goes without saying that the issues on which we work are at the center of our consciousness, uh, that these uh, that these systems are under extraordinary stress and strain. And we will hear about some of that uh, in this conversation tonight. Um, we uh, are thrilled that you could be with us. We're thrilled that our guests, two of the country's leading journalists covering uh, the, this convulsive period uh, in our politics and in our nation's life, we're thrilled that they can be with us. And I am uh, very happy to turn, over, uh, turn this over to our moderator tonight, uh, Yamish Alcindor, as you undoubtedly know, is the anchor and moderator of Washington Week on PBS and is a political commentator and contributor for NBC News and MSNBC. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Um, and even though it's virtual, um, on January 6, 2020, as thousands filled the National Mall to contest the electoral count, Donald Trump Jr., the president's son, attacked Republicans in Congress for their disloyalty. After four years, don't they, don't they get it? This isn't the Rep their Republican Party anymore. This is Donald Trump's Republican Party. How quickly it seems the party of Lincoln and Reagan fractured. Trump, president, former President Trump, was distant from standard party figures such as Mitt Romney and, John, and the late Senator John McCain. Through disinformation and conspiracy, he could expertly tap into the fears and grievances that had been festering on the right for years. Many of his supporters came to believe that both party establishments would take away their social, financial, and political power. From the John Birch Society to the Tea Party to the far right groups protesting on January 6th, right wing discontent has never been far from the surface. However, the Republican Party seemed to have missed critical signs of its waning influence over voters. Now, what does it mean as the nation prepares for the midterms and later the 2024 presidential election? Joining me is reporter Jeremy Peters. Jeremy, my friend, covers national politics for the New York Times and is an MSNBC political contributor. His coverage of the last three presidential elections focused on how forces in media, culture, and religion are reshaping American politics. To order his book, Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and Got Everything They Ever Wanted, please visit the link in the chat. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Yamish. I'm really looking forward to this and looking forward to the audience questions. These are always my favorite part of, of these kinds of things is getting to take questions from everybody who was kind enough to log on and spend a part of their evening with us. So let's get to it. Well, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. You're one of my best friends for my times at the New York Times, and I'm so excited for this book. Um, of course, just like you always do, you have perfect timing for this book because there's really no better night. I was texting you this, and I think it's very true. For those who are, who are joining us, there is no better night to talk about the rift going on in the GOP than tonight. 
Um, of course, there's all this news about the vice president, former vice president Mike Pence, finally acknowledging verbally that former President Trump is wrong when he says and has been saying that that Pence could have overturned the election. How does that reporting, how does that, that, that those statements um, from the former vice president, how does that connect with your reporting, Jeremy? So I think it's important to remember in the not so distant past that Mike Pence called January 6th quote, one day in January. He was very dismissive of the fact that people were storming through the halls of Congress calling for his head, calling for him to be hanged. And it, it, it was really striking to me uh, hearing what he said last week, given that for the last five years, he has essentially been a yes man for Donald Trump. He has not dared cross him from Access Hollywood to Charlottesville to Ukraine to January 6th. All he would really do that day was, was speak privately of his frustration to Republican senators. Uh, and, 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 you know, I go through some of this in the book, but I asked President Trump, I had the chance to ask Trump about this and, and, and uh, about the, the chance for Mike Pence's execution. And I said, OK, did it bother you? that there were people calling for his head, that they wanted to kill him. And, and Trump's response really showed the level of denial and delusion that I think really has, has, has affected a lot of the Republican Party these days. He told me that he didn't really think that these, these people meant it. They, they weren't really going to do Mike Pence any harm. And that's just an extraordinary disconnect from reality. And one I think that has become a lot more common with the, with Republicans these days, whose political power flows from President Trump. And unless voters decide that they don't want anything to do with Trump anymore, I wouldn't be looking to our elected officials, to Republicans in Congress and state houses, to, to make that call, to distance themselves from Trump. I mean, let's be honest. What, what Mike Pence said, which of course came, I think for people who were looking for more, more backbone from him five years too late, is what we've heard before from Republicans time and time again. How many National Review editorials, Wall Street Journal op-eds, statements from Mitt Romney and Susan Collins and Mitch McConnell, who we've heard from again today, it, it, this is, it, it all ends up in the same place at the end of the day, at the end of a 48 hour week long news cycle, whatever. It always ends up with Donald Trump still the undisputed leader of the party. And I think Pence is, is, is really kind of emblematic of the way that Trump has taken over his, his, his humiliation is emblematic of the way that Trump took over the Republican Party and, and stamped out almost everyone else who is standing in his way. Without Mike Pence, I think you can make the case that you don't have a President Trump. Mike Pence, remember, brought along all of the social conservatives, or at least gave them reassurances that Trump wasn't, you know, if they, if they were gonna take a chance on Trump, roll the dice on Trump, at least they knew that Mike Pence was there. But Trump, showed social conservatives and evangelical Christians that they don't need someone like Pence. They don't need a politician who is one of them, who's been married to the same woman for 30 years, can recite the Bible chapter and verse. That model, which was so enduring in Republican politics for so long, I mean, look back at some of the, of the presidential candidates over the years, from Ted Cruz to Gary Bauer to Rick Santorum, they all thought that they could win over that religious right constituency because they were part of that constituency. Trump couldn't have been further from that. And guess what? He ended up delivering, you know, as, as the subtitle of, of, of my book says, everything Republicans ever wanted. And while that, that may not be literally true, it's kind of hard to look at the Supreme Court today and say that Mike Pence's style of leadership is devalued in the eyes of many conservatives who saw Trump's slash and burn style and said, you know what, I'm okay with that.
Yeah. I mean, those are all such smart points. Um, and when you think about the fact that that what you say about sort of the humiliation of Vice President, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence being emblematic of the, the GOP takeover, what's also emblematic of the GOP takeover is the Republican National Committee um, sparking fierce backlash after it described January 6th when a mob of former President Trump's followers breached the Capitol, attacked people in a deadly insurrection as, quote, political, as, quote, legitimate legitimate political discourse. That's the way the RNC resolution phrases what happened on January 6th. And also that's also on the same time, at the same time um, that they were censuring Re representatives Kinzinger and Cheney. Of course, you write about Adam Kinzinger very early in the book. Um, but to me, I'm also thinking it's really interesting because as we're talking about sort of this rift um, and who always ends up on top, which at least for, for now has been over and over again, former President Trump, you also had now Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell pushing back on the RNC saying, no, what happened on January 6th was a violent insurrection with the purpose, he said, of trying to prevent a peaceful transfer of power after a legitimately certified election. When we see McConnell, who has been an interesting character, someone you write about, an interesting character in the GOP, what do you make of that? Again, today's news really going right into your book and going right into your reporting. Look, I think there are a lot of Republicans, Mitch McConnell included, who would love to be done with Donald Trump. They have, they never wanted him to be president uh, and, and they were stuck with him for four years, but could swallow their misgivings, look the other way, turn their, you know, turn a blind eye to all of his, his flaws and, uh, and, and his frankly, like borderline illegal behavior um, because they were getting something tangible in terms of, policy results, right? And and they had a leader of the party who was winning, helping them win elections. I think people like McConnell worry that that's no longer the case, that Trump may be a political liability. And, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. One of the things, one of the themes of the book is that, or the theme, I should say, because it's the title, is that the history of the modern Republican Party is a history of insurgencies. And, you know, I go back to Pat Buchanan uh, and, and trace it from Buchanan to Palin to the Tea Party to Donald Trump. And it's always ended up with those insurgent elements basically throwing whoever is in charge out of power. That happened with Buchanan when he ran against George H.W. Bush in 1992. It happened with the Tea Party, uh, it, who ended up deposing John Boehner. Um, and it ended up, um, uh, and that's the way it happened with, with Sarah Palin, right? Um, I mean, she was the vice presidential nominee, but she became the most popular figure on that ticket with John McCain. She was the one who was able to draw the crowds of tens of thousands of people when McCain could only draw a few hundred or, or, or a couple thousand at most on a good day. And he started bringing her with him to events because he wanted to draw a bigger crowd. So I think that the, the answer to your question is, is it's complicated, right? Because we don't know if somebody like Mitch McConnell is right at the end of the day. Is Trump ultimately going to be uh, a, a, a drag on Republicans? If he runs again, is he going to lose? You know, I, I don't know. I'm not going to venture. I'm not, it's not my job to, to have a crystal ball here. But I will say that if you look at the modern history of the Republican Party, Donald, the Donald Trump's, you know, the, the, because he is the leader of the party, let's not forget always end up on the losing side of the insurgency. And Trump has been getting, I should say, the base has been getting further and further to the right of Donald Trump. And at this point, the question you need to ask yourself or the question I would be asking myself if I were Donald Trump is, is this the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene now or is this the party of Donald Trump? And I think there's a pretty good case to be made Starting, you know, with the fact that that he was booed at one of his own events for suggesting that people get vaccinated and boosted, that he may be losing his golden touch. That people no longer see him as the as as, as the uh, leader of the party. That you know, the un undisputable leader of the party. This this you know, almost infallible political figure uh, that they used to. Yeah.
Yeah. I mean, you touched on so many things that I want to ask you about. I do want to remind people who are watching, please, please, please put your questions in the chat, put hashtag questions. So we know that it's a question. Um, we'll be getting to you shortly. So please, please, please get ready to ask Jeremy your own questions. Now, Jeremy, I was going to ask you um, about Sarah Palin, but before I ask you about Sarah Palin, you, cause you touched so much on sort of the vulnerability um, that former president Trump could have within his own insurgency. And the few times, as you mentioned that I've seen, former President Trump booed, it was on vaccines. It was when he was telling people to get the vaccine or when he quickly admitted, which is something he never really does, when he quickly admitted that he got the booster shot, you heard people boo him um, when he was on stage. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how much of your reporting talked about sort of COVID and vaccines and whether or not that could be the softest spot for, for sort of taking over the party that used to be Donald Trump's party, which is still Donald Trump's party. But I wonder how much you think COVID might factor into that. Well, this is kind of where Donald Trump's ego um, is 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 causing trouble for his political instinct. You know, this this political instinct of his that he claims is just singular and, and unmatched. Um, I happen to know the backstory behind why he talked about vaccines at that at a, that event with Bill O'Reilly, and it, it, it's pretty amusing. What what happened essentially, uh, and I don't I don't know that this has been reported, and it happened too late to uh, for me to get in the book. Um, but essentially what I heard is that Bill O'Reilly, who was hosting the event with Trump, told Trump that he needed to start taking more credit for the vaccines because they were manufactured, produced, developed, you know, under his presidency. He did, uh, to his credit, do a uh, uh, push, push forward operation warp speed. Um, but he didn't want to talk about that a whole lot at first. And uh, and and he saw Biden getting credit for it. He, Trump was was reluctant to talk about it because he knew that his you know remember he wouldn't tell us whether or not he was vaccinated at first. And it took uh, a, a New York Times reporter uh, Maggie Haberman to break the story that he had in fact been vaccinated. They didn't release that publicly. Um, but once he saw, and this is where I why I mentioned his his ego getting the better of him um, is. Once he saw Biden getting credit for the vaccines, he wanted that credit. And, and, and O'Reilly said to him backstage, look, you need to go out there and remind people that this is you. You helped do this. This is your success. And he did it. And his base didn't want to hear it. And his famed political instinct uh, didn't, didn't kick in. Uh, he didn't realize that this was something that his audience didn't want to hear um, so, you know, at the same time that, you you know, you wonder if you know, his, his hold on the party is slipping, you know, you, you don't have to look too far to see an example of, you know, his his political instincts getting a bit rusty um, with his with his base as far as with, with knowing what his base does and doesn't want. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting to think of sort of his ego um, tussling with sort of his political instincts. Um, we talking about political instincts, talking about sort of leaning into to decisions and how you hold how how you make these decisions. You write and you there were some there was some reporting, um, new scoopy reporting, I should say, about John McCain, the late senator John McCain from Arizona, and his choice to pick Sarah Palin. She's of course back in the news. Talk a bit about your reporting there and, and what um, you learned as you were writing this book. So Sarah Palin is someone that I refer to in the book as the tip of the spear for everything that we are experiencing now in Republican politics. Um, and, and that is a phrase that actually uh, one of Donald Trump's pollsters used to describe Sarah Palin, uh, because Sarah Palin was, I think, the, the ultimate proto-Trump figure I mean, in, in, in more ways than just her political rhetoric. I mean, let's not forget, um, she was, was, was really effective at using social media as a workaround to the mainstream media. She used that Facebook page um, so she didn't have to do interviews uh, with the, the, the major networks or, or, or news outlets. Um, she turned the media into her enemy. She accused them of making things up which is kind of a precursor to Trump's fake news. Um, and, and Sarah Palin was also deep down in a way that, that Trump is not genuinely himself. She was like deep down kind of this, this figure with wounded 
pride because as I get into in, in the book, um, she had this, this um, it's kind of a, a slur up in Alaska. They, they, they call these people um, valley trash. And that's a reference to the part of Alaska where Sarah Palin's from, the Matsu Valley. And it's a less prosperous area. Uh, it's, it's more evangelical. They call it the Bible Belt of Alaska. And the people in Anchorage used to sometimes uh, uh, make fun of them, calling them valley trash. And, and Palin, you know, while she was kind of wounded by that, also took that and wore that as a badge of honor. And that was an early version of what you saw Trump and Trump supporters do with the, the nickname deplorables. You know, Hillary Clinton's infamous way to describe um, uh, Donald Trump supporters back in 2016. So it, she very much I, I tapped into this, this, this sense that the other team, those elites, those those blue bloods, as Sarah Palin would say, you know, to use her words, actually, she called the blue bloods specifically she used to describe the Bush family, but that, that those people look down on people like her and the voters that she represented. And that was a very powerful sentiment um, that I don't think John McCain's campaign fully appreciated when they nominated her. Hmm. Mm, thinking about in, in some ways they unleashed something that they weren't quite realizing that they were picking up there. Um, I want to, in some ways, I would have asked you this question at the beginning of this, had your book not been so newsy. Um, but in 2016, of course, we covered the election together. I was on one side riding in a bus with Bernie Sanders, who was supposed to be the sleepy candidate. But we, and, and you were, of course, on the other side covering um, Republicans. We both, those experienced this feeling and 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 witnessed sort of this disgruntled sense um of 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 the party um having to reckon with their bases wanting something different wanting something that they that they didn't really expect i wonder what you saw on the ground in particular that made you want to write this book in other words why did you write this book so just like as a little aside i i remember yamish once uh when you were covering um bernie at the 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 to, uh, the 2016 convention um, in Philadelphia, and it was just like a horribly suffocatingly hot day. Um, and there were all of these demonstrators there. And I remember them being so angry about Hillary, uh, just, just vilifying her, saying just like the, the, like the most vile things at this march that was coming down the street in front of the convention hall. And I remember thinking to myself, like, God, what is, is, is this a Trump rally? Like, what is going on here? Because I had never heard that level of vitriol uh, directed at her in any kind of like mass setting like that, especially one that was supposed to be full of people who were from the left. Right. Um, but that sentiment really made me uh, see that there was something bigger going on in American politics that transcended left and right. It was this, this, this anger that politics uh, the, the, the government um, in both parties wasn't doing enough for people. And, yeah, I, I thought about that a lot after the 2016 election because I was having um, lunch one day with this, this Republican strategist who'd worked for the Bushes, he'd worked for Romney and you know, very much an, a, an establishment kind of guy. And he was saying that like all uh, they were still so dumbfounded, all the political science textbooks were going to have to be rewritten because no one could explain how you go in the Republican Party from uh, Bush, Bush, McCain, Romney. And it, it, he, he, he was right. And I thought to myself, as like, I was a kid. When I was a kid, I loved the presidents. I loved American politics. And I collected, you know, the little figurines of the presidents. And I had placemats um, that had like all the presidents' um, heads uh, or like little portraits of the presidents all, all, all right around it. And uh, I just remember thinking about Trump in that context, like someday when kids are looking at the chart on their classroom wall or one of those placemats like I had, and they see, you know, Clinton, Bush, uh, Obama, uh, Trump, how are you going to explain that? Right. Because he's I mean, he, he was somebody with zero political experience, a pop culture figure and, and really nothing with, with like no no political um, uh, background whatsoever. How are you going to tell people the story of what led to that? And I wanted this book to be 
the one on the shelf 25 years from now that helped provide a fuller context of exactly how he ended up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and your title, as, as you sit, you talk about the sort of wanting this longevity for this book, your title insurgency, it seems fitting, of course, given what happened on January 6th and the Capitol attack and all that we're seeing happen. But actually, word is that you settled on this title when you first had the idea to write this book. Why is insurgency an apt metaphor for the GOP past and present? Right. That's that's a great question, because I, I, I did um, have this title in my book proposal. Like th this was the idea all along. And that was back in January uh, 2017, because the history of the Republican Party has been a history of eruptions, spasms uh, and, and, and revolts that have threatened, um, but not always toppled the leadership of the party. And the reason that those revolts have over the years been so destabilizing, kind of like, you know, a, a, a building in a, an earthquake zone that has been rattled uh, from time to time by, by tremors, um, the cracks form and then eventually one uh, comes along that's, that's too much and the whole foundation crumbles and the building falls down. It, it was kind of like that. And, and I saw that most clearly with the Pat Buchanan insurgency. Um, and like I said, this, this, this notion that the Republicans were ultimately responsible for this themselves because they let those elements in the party, well, they didn't let them into the party uh, so much as they did. They, try, they gave them power, they tried to share power, and they tried to co-opt them, assuming that these insurgent elements would be faithful partners when often they had no interest in partnership they saw themselves as the, the rightful leaders of the party, the ones who commanded the most votes, and they wanted the power. They wanted to be in charge. And so it, it kind of starts for me with Pat Buchanan in 1992, and, and, and the George H.W. Bush campaign invites him, after he's been defeated um, in the Republican primary, to give a speech uh, in prime time at the National Convention. Uh, you know, this is this is a good faith gesture on, on Bush's part, right? Invite his former rival who had said all sorts of critical things about him uh, during during the primary to deliver a speech uh, in front of the nation that tens of millions of people are going to watch. Uh, and what did Pat Buchanan do? He gave uh, the most memorable convention speech in modern political history, which uh, many people probably remember by the nickname, the culture war speech, where he excoriated the Clintons and the evils of homosexuality and, and talked about the, this, the struggle versus good and evil. And Republican elites were horrified. There are, there are pictures, I believe, of, of, of the Bush family uh, watching the speech and, and from their box, and they're just they look like they've been punched in the face. Um, and Buchanan was uh, attacked after it. He was attacked in the mainstream media. Uh, he was attacked by, by mainstream Republicans. Um, but in my book, uh, I, I draw on an unpublished memoir that Buchanan wrote that he, he let me see as I was doing my research. And he's just delighted by this criticism. He, he's, he's, in fact, specifically delighted by this one criticism calling him crazy in the New York Times, where a, a famous biographer of Richard Nixon says, uh, says that Buchanan let the crazies inside the tent, and he loves it. So it's, it's, like, it's at that point where I think I kind of begin to trace the insurgencies over the years uh, that, that were a result of Republican leaders in Washington assuming that they had faithful partners in conservative renegades when in fact these conservative renegades thought that they sh they were the ones that should be in charge and have the power yeah and the language that you use to calling them conservative renegades it really does i think um give the book the sort of lasting power that you that you wanted to have because we're going to be talking about these conservative renegades or just these conservatives maybe in 10 years and, and and really thinking of the renegades maybe as the people who used to be establishment so i think it's important um to to, to hone in on that and to make that through line that you just did um now our host the brennan center focuses on voting rights and the barriers to accessing the ballot 
As you report in Insurgency, former President Donald Trump was long fixated on exaggerating, sometimes even fabricating, often fabricating claims of voter fraud by Democrats. Walk us through some of that and how it fits into what we're seeing with Republican lawmakers today. And of course, with the former president, former President Trump continuing to make those false claims, continuing to lie about the election. So uh, this kind of was it, it, it was driven home for me. Uh, when I was reporting the chapter about Roger Ailes and Fox News and its role, it's it's like it's really, uh, I think, trend, the climactic role uh, in in the 2012 Republican primaries um, when Roger Ailes uh, was was upset about Mitt Romney as a nominee because he didn't think that Mitt Romney was tough enough, angry enough, wasn't the kind of guy who was going to, you know, as, as I uh, quote someone in the book, say, rip Obama's face off. Um, and just as an aside, I think that's why, if anybody remembers the, the, that Republican primary and how nasty it was, which is why these candidates like Newt Gingrich kept doing really well, because they could perform in that arena. They could slug it out uh, and, and show um, just how aggressive they were. And people, voters, Republican voters saw that and, and, and realized that that's what they wanted in somebody to take on Obama. Um, anyway, that is a, a digression to, to my larger point, which is that that anger was so intense that losing was such a blow to the, 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 the Republican psyche. Because remember, the Republicans have all along, for, for decades, going back to Goldwater, considered themselves to be the true majority of the American people. You know, when Goldwater lost to Johnson uh, in, in 1964, some of his people printed these bumper stickers that said, you know, 24 million people can't be wrong. You know, it was like a way of consoling themselves that like they, they still had this overwhelming popular support. You know, it, you hear this kind of rhetoric um, of the majority used throughout Republican politics, Richard Nixon's silent majority, the moral majority of the Reagan era. So when they lose, often they insist that it can't be possible. Somebody has to be cheating. And that's what Roger Ailes believed. And, 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 and I have this scene in the book where at the end of uh, a few weeks after the 2012 election, he goes to see Mitt Romney um, and they, you know, hey, sorry, it didn't work out for you, pal. Uh, and, and Romney says, oh, well, that's okay. You know, I think my wife was actually more upset than I was. And uh, Ailes says, well, you know, that's because Democrats are dirty. They, they give their voters stuff for free and they always cheat. And Fox News was a big part of perpetuating that lie. They ran story after story about supposed voter fraud in 2012. You know, it's it's like that uh, uh, that and, and, and I watched. I was watching Fox News on the night of the election in 2012, um, and there were all these stories about irregularities at the polls um, that it reminded me of that famous uh, uh, scene from Citizen Kane when. They figure out at, at, at uh, you know his newspaper editors Charles Kane uh, Charles Kane's newspaper editors figure out that he's going to lose uh, the race for governor, and <laughs> they switch the headlines um, from saying Kane wins to uh, Kane loses fraud at polls suspected, and you know that's that's really deep in the Republican consciousness, um, and I think you know the laws that we're seeing passed today are a reflection of. And it's so interesting to hear to, to think about the fact that we're so now having to be focused on sort of domestic misinformation and it in a mainstream major political party when 2016 was all about sort of Russia and misinformation and sort of it coming from the outside. That being said, of course, 2016 was the year that former President Donald Trump won. You spoke you spent a lot of time talking with him um, for this book. Now we've heard from Trump so many times at rallies when he used to be on Twitter. He, if you watch conservative media, he's usually giving an interview, but it's different of course, when you have Jeremy Peters, you being a great reporter sitting down with him for a while. What did you learn about in your conversations with former president Trump that surprised you? And what did you learn there that you maybe gave you insight that you didn't have before? So 
I interviewed him more than once, and there was about uh, uh, like a six month gap uh, in, in those interviews. And one of the things that I heard that stuck with me was how much angrier and more detached from reality he got over the course of those six months, right? So the first interview, he's still stewing about no longer being in the White House. I think maybe to, to, to some degree, um, he, he, seemed, he seemed down uh, because, you know, how can you, when, when you go from being the most important person on the planet, the focus of every, every news story out there, the, the, the man who can move markets and news cycles with a few uh, flicks of his fingers and thumbs, uh, to go to you know your 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 house on the on the beach, um, it's kind of a come down. So I attributed some of it to that. But uh, the, you know the, the second time I spoke with him at length, you could hear the the, the resentment building. He he started taking credit for Republican victories, and it was almost as if, and this is why I think that the fraud stuff in his mind is real. Like he, I, I have a quote in the book um, from Steve Bannon, who said that, you know, in, in, in a moment of candor about Trump, um, that Trump is the guy that believes his own lies. Like as soon as it comes out of his mouth, it's true to him. And that's what he, he, he I really think is going on with this, this, fraud, uh, this fraud narrative in the stolen election. He now thinks it's true. Um, and, and it's the part of the reason why he can't believe that he lost is because so many other Republicans won. So he, he he's talking to me and he goes down the list of virtually every Senate Republican who ran in 2020 and won and says, I, I got that person elected. I did a rally for this person and this and they got elected because of me. Uh, and, and he talks about Ron DeSantis, um, who now, you know, he's 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 been he's been feuding with sniping with behind the scenes. And he says to me, you know, I, I helped Ron at a level no one's ever seen before. So he he really thinks that, that he built this almost like this is his Republican Party to take credit for and to control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, in that idea, thinking about the fact that this is his Republican Party to control, um, I'm going to in some ways borrow an audience question because it was my question. It was my last question to you, but also the the, the first audience question. So I'm going to mesh them together. How serious, based on your conversations with former President Trump, does he seem to be about running in 2024? And the audience question was, um, do you what do you think will happen if Trump runs and loses again? Hmm. Uh, well, I'll start with the first part of that um, by with a, with a caveat. Um, it, Trump has always been somebody who changes his mind constantly. In 2015, when he was deciding to run, a few weeks before, according to my reporting, he wanted to call it off. Uh, so he's gonna he's gonna vacillate. Um, that's just natural for him. Um, I my, my what I said when people asked me that question after I first interviewed him a year ago was uh, it, 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 my answer is the same as it was then, which is if the election were tomorrow, I think he absolutely would run. Uh, of course, the election's not tomorrow. So, you know, we, we have some if, if there's something preventing him from running, you know, a, a health issue something financial, although it's hard for me to, 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 to contemplate what uh, like a financial um, uh, incentive would be for him not to run since he's going to raise so much money and he can only uh, he can only do that as, as, as the, you know, the, the de facto leader of the party. Um, unless something unforeseen happens, my guess is that he's going to do it for the reasons I was I was I was laying out in the previous answer, because he in my mind, believes that this was taken from him. He believes that he lost illegitimately. And so he is going to avenge this grave injustice uh, and take back the White House from the illegitimate President Joe Biden. This is this is what he, I, I think, genuinely believes. And that's, uh, you know, if that's not a motivator for somebody to run again, I don't know what is. Wow. Wow. Um we know that it's, we've heard him say it, but it's, it's, it's just, again, kind of head spinning to hear it from you. Um, the next question from the audience is, does, is Donald Trump gaining more support ahead of 2024? In other words, is he expanding his base? Is he, is he getting more people to come to the altar of Donald Trump? 
No, I, I think it's it's at the, at the moment it's the opposite. <clears throat> um, I think he's you know he's he's <clears throat> clearly alienating you know some Republicans who are who are even more sick of it than they were uh, in 2020. Um, and now that he's not in power and doesn't have anything to deliver to them um, in terms of of political favors or or, or policy wish list items, um, it's it's harder for those Republicans to kind of look past all the nonsense. But I, I do think that you know that that dynamic could fundamentally change a year or two from now. You know, a, a year from now, basically. You know, when we're uh, we're looking at a, a new, potentially likely Republican um, House of Representatives and, and, and possibly even Senate, too. Um, he's, you know, he will. It's hard to calculate. I, I, what I'm trying to say is it's hard to calculate exactly what his popularity is, his pull with Republican voters right now, because he's been off the radar a bit. Like, you know, being off of Twitter, no longer being president, not uh, being on television, um, although maybe sometimes if you watch cable news, it seems that that, that he might still be president because because he gets so much coverage. Uh, that, that that absence from the public eye has has had its, its toll. I don't know what it looks like when he comes back. Do people get sick of him again Do, are they just you know turning the channel because he does have this this effect on people even on republicans you know that, that they just don't want to hear from him um because it's it's too much it's like somebody said to me um he he's like the bad tv show you can't turn off um but that said the democrats political troubles could could be so uh, overwhelming and their their, their reputation um, among voters uh, for uh, and the blame that they get uh, for various problems, you know, in in the economy with schools, with with, with COVID shutdowns, um, that could also allow a lot of voters to once again begin turning a blind eye to all of Trump's flaws. Mm. And you're talking about you know voters possibly turning a blind eye. Um, to former President Trump's flaws, this audience member wants to know, will all of this, and I think this the, this is, is sort of all that you mentioned in your book, maybe all that we've been talking about um, tonight, will this cause the Republican Party to split into the Trump, the party of Trump and the never Trumpers? In other words, do you envision the GOP ever splitting? So I used to think this, like, because you know, in, in, in political science, you learn that like there's there are these realignments and um parties split from one another and, um, and, and new political coalitions uh, form out of those ashes. Here's the thing. The never Trump constituency in, in the Republican Party is too small to be a party of its own. Like, I mean, they're effectively Democrats, right? Like Bill Crystal and, and, and you know, as, 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 uh, as, as thoughtful as, as, as Bill Crystal can be and, and as, as genuinely concerned about the direction of, of his party as he obviously is, that's not... Uh, a constituency. I mean, it's people talk about the, you know, the civil war in the Republican Party. Um, the civil war's over and, and, and those guys lost. And in fact, what I've been hearing more of is the way that those Republicans, never Trump Republicans, um, want to find ways where they can run as Democrats. And they're running into trouble doing that because obviously, you know, what 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 Democratic uh, party operation is going to want, you know, somebody who's who's been a registered Republican up until uh, just recently. So that, but that's it's something to keep an eye on. Um, and it's 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 another um, another potential problem if Trump is at the top of the ticket again for the Republican Party. Right. Because he is so toxic with swing voters. And, and, and I don't know, it's it, like, I don't know what it takes for people. I'm not saying it's impossible, but um, what it takes for people to forget all of that, um, who, who were on the fence and who voted for him in 2020, but didn't vote for him in 2024. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not terribly confident um, that that, uh, that that washes away all of his, you know, all, all of the, the problems, the just the memories of, of, oh my God, we have to go through another four years of this again that I think um, a lot of Americans felt and why a lot of them switched their votes. Yeah.
Yeah. And you, and you just talked about the former president being toxic. Um, this audience member wants to know, is the allegiance of the GOP to Trump tied to his ability to raise money? I think um, that is a big part of it because he is still a huge small dollar fundraiser. I mean, that's the, the, I forget the statistic I saw the other day, but the, the you know, the amount of money um, that, that he pulled in as an ex president, I mean, it's, 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 un, it's unprecedented. It continues to be unprecedented. And that's, you know, I mean, I would see this on the ground all the time. It's, it's, you go to his rallies where I was at one in uh, uh, January, the middle of January in Arizona outside Phoenix. And he's still capable of drawing crowds of you know, 15,000 people at these events. And a lot of those people then turn around and give money or they have given money in the past. And, you know, you, you multiply that out, even though, you know, they're giving 10, 20, $50. That's a lot. And, uh, uh, I would I would just add a footnote there though that the I believe the biggest uh, one certainly one of the biggest if not the biggest fundraiser for Republicans um, in, in in the last cycle was Marjorie Taylor Greene and that kind of brings me back to the point uh, you know the, the 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 question really how sustainable is Trump's grip on the party if you have Marjorie Taylor Greene stealing some of his thunder. And, you know, I've seen her at his events before and, you know, whatever else she is, she is an incredibly dynamic speaker who engages these audiences and, and really, really pulls them in uh, and, and they love it. And it actually reminds me a lot of what I saw in Sarah Palin in 2008. Uh, of course, like I said, what that means for Trump I, I, I don't know, but it's another example of the way that I think the base of the party is 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 uh, way to the right of him at the moment. Mm. Um, well, this audience member, um, you talking about sort of the base of the party being where the base of the party is. This audience member wants to know, is there a path for mainstream Republicans to steer the party towards a more moderate path? I would say that this question is the question on the mind of all the never Trumpers. What, what, what's your answer to that? I point to recent history uh, every, every time I, I get a question like this. And, you know, I mean, I remember on on um, on January 6th or in the aftermath of January 6th, a lot of people were asking me, oh, well, you know, surely the Republicans will vote to convict in the Senate. And we I mean, remember that. Remember, like, the, the, hor like the horror of that day, the shock, you know, watching the, the, these people in Trump hats, waving Trump flags, bludgeoning officers and storming through the halls of the Capitol, smashing windows and smearing blood on statues. Like, that, I, I think, if, if there were any moment at which the Republican Party decided to, dec to decisively break with the president, that would have been it. But instead, what happened? There were nine, I believe, in, in, in the Senate who voted to, uh, to, maybe not that many, I forget exactly, in, in the, who, who voted to convict him. Um, 10 Republicans in the House who voted to impeach. Um, I, every time there is a, a, almost like an opportunity, I guess I would, I would say, for Republicans to draw a line, a bright red line, enough is enough. Um, they don't do it. Yeah, they don't do it. Um, and this this audience member, you talked a little bit about the idea of, um, of, of questioning whether or not this is becoming the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene or will remain the party of Donald Trump. Um, someone in the audience wants to know, could you clarify? And I would say, if you could, I would add my own. Could you expand on that? The idea that the GOP, um, that the base, the, the people that have sort of been the Trumpers that have been the engine behind his ability to, to have this grip on the GOP, could they be going essentially past him? Um, could he be losing control of these people? And then you have someone like a Marjorie Taylor Greene um, that becomes the person who's who, who is sort of owning the identity of the GOP. Right. So I think about this in terms of uh, which, which I think is, is, is important to do. And, and you, know, you just can't overlook this as a factor um, uh, in, in, in radicalizing people. Um, the, the context of, of COVID. 
um, and, and the vaccines and, and the mandates and, and shutdowns, um, that is basically a stand in for a lot of voters for what they see as a, a government that is is out to control their lives. It, is, it, is, it has too much power um, and it's it's coming for them. And, and, and while those notions um, obviously are, are exaggerated, um, there's this this very real fear rooted in false misinformation, disinformation and misinformation. And what I meant when I said, you know, is, is this the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene? You know, I think a lot of people who um, have been radicalized during the COVID era uh, about the government um, in, in, in see the government as even more of an enemy uh, than, you know, your average Republican already did. The, those people are, are, are angry uh, and, and, and they're voting. Um, and if anything, as, as you know, I try to lay out in, in this book, um, the, the, the history of the modern Republican Party is, is one where these insurgencies were fueled by anger. I mean, that's, that's something that, um, as I was reporting this, uh, the, 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 one, the Trump's pollster said to me, he went back and he, you know, he, he, he looks at the Republican Party kind of every, every decade or so to see how the electorate has changed. And in 2000, and I'm sorry, in, in, in 1997, because this is, he had worked for Bob Dole as Bob Dole's pollster, he had a, a, a segment of his pie chart that showed the different segments of the electorate for progressive Republicans. I mean, just think about how antiquated that term sounds now, a progressive Republican. Well, 10 years later, there were no progressive Republicans left uh, to, to warrant um, a, a piece of his pie. Um, you know, fast forward to 2021, Trump's pollster runs the same survey asking questions about what Republican voters believe and fully 10% of the Republican electorate today is what uh, he describes as the InfoWars Republican. And these are people who believe in not just one conspiracy theory, uh, but several, several conspiracy theories espoused by QAnon. And that's 10% of the Republican electorate. It just, it just shows you um, how, how radicalized um, politics has become on the right. Yeah. And we only have time for two quick questions. I'm going to ask you the first one. The first one is, what role, this is the last audience question, what role do you think the media plays in this, in the GOP, in the split, in sort of Trump script on, on the GOP? So this is also a theme that I deal with in the book, because I don't, I always thought when I set out to write this, that it was impossible to tell the story of the modern Republican Party without dealing a lot with the influence of media figures like Rush Limbaugh uh, and, and Roger Ailes. Um, and, and what you see in the Republican Party is unique to American politics. It doesn't happen in the Democratic Party. You know, as much as, as they love to say that the, the Democratic Party controls the New York Times and we're just you know, writing, writing the Democratic platform on our editorial page all, all the time or in our news articles even, it's just not true. The level of, 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 of coordination collusion is just not there between the, you know, the mainstream, quote unquote, liberal media uh, and, and these Democratic campaigns. But what I discovered and, and report out in the book is the way that those links are very much there and, and grew stronger in the Trump era uh, than, than ever before. And it's like they they are doing what they always accuse us of doing, which is colluding with with uh, uh, with, with a political party, and and you know a couple examples um, I, I get into. You know, one of them is is this moment when Donald Trump invites Rush Limbaugh to Mar-a-Lago, and this is after the election, during the transition in 2016. And yeah, I don't want to give every, everything away in the book because I hope people will still buy it. But Rush Limbaugh gives advice to, to Trump. Uh, that, that he carries with him through the rest of his presidency. It sticks with him. It's funny because when I asked Trump about this, he's, let's face it, he's not the most like introspective guy. He's not one to talk about how other people have influenced him because, you know, everything kind of flows <laughs> out, out from him, right? Um, uh, he, he alone did this. 
uh, so to speak, to use his words. But um, the the idea that uh, that's Rush, what Rush said to him, stuck with him. It was really, really interesting to me. But also um, uh, the way that Breitbart, I get into how Breitbart wasn't just a Trump pro Trump platform. Um, it didn't just give him a voice and and and, and allow him. Uh, uh, flattering, um, the, uh, or, or, like, to give him a media safe space. Um, what it did is it actually worked hand in hand with the Trump campaign in some of the most like memorable, disruptive, and and you know some would say horrifying episodes of the 2016 campaign, including uh, bringing Paula Jones and some of uh, Bill Clinton's female accusers to that that debate, which is a a scene I think um, most people will remember yeah um so much we could be talking about but i have one last question for you what is the one thing you want our viewers to walk away with so i know this is a book um uh this is you know we've been discussing a book here my book and books have you know a beginning middle and an end um i want people to to leave here tonight thinking about the fact that this isn't the end of the story. This isn't the end of the story of the Trump Republican Party. I don't know where in that story we are. Um, I don't think we're at the beginning anymore, but we might just be at the middle of that story, not the end. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for this conversation, for sharing your reporting. I wish you, of course, the best of luck on your new book, Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and got everything they ever wanted. Our thanks, of course, to the audience for all of your questions, which we had time to answer them all. Um, we got to a really good number of them. And thank you so much to our to, to today's partners, um, NYU's John Brendis Center, as well as the Brennan Center. It was great to be um, with both of these centers today, to have your support, to, to have you host us. So we really, really appreciate it. And again, good luck, Jeremy. Great job with the book.